The Nutcracker and the Mouse King by E. T. A. Hoffman. Chapter 2 The Presents. I put it to yourself, my friendly listener, Fred, Fanny, Eddie, whatever be your name, and beg you to bring clearly before your eyes your own last Christmas tree or table adorned with pretty gay presents. Then you can very well understand how these children stopped, dumbfounded, with sparkling eyes, only after a little Mary cried with a deep sigh of delight. Oh, how beautiful! How beautiful! And how Fred jumped for joy to relieve his feelings. All the past year, indeed, they must have been particularly good and well-behaved, for never had they had such a number of delightful presents as this time. The great fir tree in the middle bore ever so many gold and silver apples, and for buds and blossoms every branch hung thick with almonds and brightly colored sugar plums and other best kinds of goodies. But the finest thing about the marvelous tree must not be forgotten, that a hundred small lights twinkled like stars among its foliage, so that, illuminated as it was inside and outside, it seemed to invite the children to pluck its fruits and flowers. And round about the tree everything shone gay and splendid, all the fine presents there, who could ever describe them? Mary caught sight of the most elegant dolls, all sorts of neat little dolls as furniture, and what seemed finest of all, a silk frock prettily decked with colored ribbons stood spread out on a dress stand before her eyes, so that she could admire it from every side, as she did, crying out again and again, Oh, pretty! Oh, the dear dress! And can I... May I really put it on? Meanwhile, Fred, galloping and trotting round three or four times, tried his new cock horse, which he indeed found bridled and saddled on the table. Dismounting, he reported that it was a wild creature, but no matter, he would soon break it in and proceeded to muster his new squadron of hussars, who were gorgeously equipped in red and gold, with silver swords, and rode such shiny white horses that these also might be believed of pure silver. The children had got over their excitement a little, and were able to take a look at the picture books, which lay open so as to display pretty flowers and brightly colored figures of people, even of dear little children at play, painted as naturally as if they lived and spoke. Yes, Fred and Mary were settling down upon these wonderful picture books, when, cling ling cling ling the bell rang again. They knew that now it was Godfather Drosselmeyer's turn, and ran to the table standing by the wall. The screen that had so long ago concealed it was quickly drawn away, and what did the young folks see? On a green lawn, bespangled with gay flowers, stood a most noble castle, all plate-glass windows and gilded towers. A chime of bells was heard, doors and windows flew open, and you saw how very tiny but most elegant ladies and gentlemen, with feathers in their hats and trailing skirts, moved inside the rooms. In the central hall, that seemed to be on fire, so many lights burned there in silver chandeliers, children wearing short coats and vests were dancing to the music of the chimes. A gentleman in an emerald green cloak kept looking out through the window, nodding and disappearing by turns, while a figure, just like Godfather Drosselmeyer himself, but scarcely higher than Papa's thumb, would, from time to time, come and stand at the castle door and then go in again. With his arms leaning on the table, Fred had examined the dancing and walking figures, and now, he said, 
Godfather Drosselmeyer, will you let me go into your castle? The counselor replied to him that this would never do. Indeed, he spoke truly, for it was foolish of Fred to want to go into a castle which, gilded towers and all, was not so high as himself. Fred had to admit that. After a time, as the ladies and gentlemen went on walking up and down in the same way, the children dancing, the green man looking out the window, Godfather Drosselmeyer's likeness coming to the door, he cried impatiently, Godfather Drosselmeyer, now will you come out for at once at the other door? That won't do, dear Fred, answered the counselor. Well, said Fred again, just make the green man who looks out so often walk about with the others. That won't do either, repeated the counselor. Couldn't the children come downstairs? persisted Fred. I should like to see them nearer. Oh, all that won't do, said the counselor, not in very good humor. The machinery has to work as it is made. Is that the way of it? exclaimed Fred in a tone of contempt. Nothing will do. I'll tell you what, Godfather Drosselmeyer, if your fine little figures in the castle can only go on doing the same things, they are not worth much, and I don't particularly care for them. No, I would rather have my hussars, and they can maneuver forwards, backwards, as I like, and are not shut up in a house. And with this, he ran to the table and made his squadron on their silver horses trot up and down, and wheel and charge and shoot to his heart's content. Mary also had quietly slipped away, for she too soon grew tired of the strutting and capering of the puppets in the castle, but was so polite and good-natured that she would not show it so plainly as her brother Fred. Counselor Drossmeyer spoke rather crossly to her parents. Such a skillful contrivance is not for senseless children. I will pack up my castle again. But the mother came forward and got him to show her the construction and the wonderfully ingenious works by which the little puppets were set in motion. The counselor took it all to pieces and put it together again. This put him into a rather badder temper and he presented the children, furthermore, with some pretty brown men and women made of gingerbread, with gilt faces, hands, and legs, which quite delighted them. Sister Louisa had, by her mother's wish, put on the handsome dress which was her present, and looked very nice in it. But when Mary was to try on her new frock, she thought she would rather look at it a little longer, and they allowed her to have her own way.